Tonight also, the media and Hollywood liberals, they are now fawning and falling all over themselves to endorse Oprah Winfrey for a 2020 presidential bid. After, of course, her big speech at the Golden Globes, well, have they anointed a new savior? This comes amid new reports tonight that Oprah might actually run. And while Hollywood liberals are patting themselves on the back, they are ignoring their massive hypocrisy on the issue of sexual assault and misconduct. We are the only show we'll expose that. We'll cover it all in tonight's breaking news, opening monologue. Oh, we have a big monologue on Oprah tonight. I hope you want to hear my take on that. That's coming up in just a minute. But first, we have to start with tonight's breaking news. Both John Solomon and Sarah Carter this hour are reporting that congressional committees are now trying to determine if FBI agent Peter Strzok and his FBI lawyer girlfriend, Lisa Page, literally leaked information about the Russia investigation to the press. Now, here's why. Solomon reporting that text messages between Strzok and Page appear to show that in fact they had advanced knowledge about a Wall Street Journal article and it was about to be published. Now take a look at this text exchange between Page and Strzok that was obtained by The Hill. Page tells Strzok, article is out but hidden behind paywall so can't read it. And Strzok responds, Wall Street Journal? Boy, that was fast. Should I find it and tell the team? Now, there are also other text messages about the media like this one. Strzok saying, yep, the whole tone in the anti-BU, meaning the Bureau, just a tiny bit from us, Page replies, makes me feel way less bad about throwing him under the bus to the forthcoming CF article. Wow. Now, according to The Hill, Congress is now trying to figure out what the CF article means and who Strzok and Page were trying to throw under the bus. Now, there's a message here in all of this. Lisa Page says, well, we got a list of kids with their parents' names. How many of this reporter from The New York Times could be there in D.C.? Now, The Hill's reporting that Strzok and Page exchanged the text messages about tracking down information about a New York Times reporter that they were referencing in that text. Why would they be looking into a New York Times reporter? Page then writes, well, wow, found what I think might be their addresses, too. And Strzok says he's totally schlubby. Don't you remember? And Strzok and Page also take horrible shots at the New York Post. Uh, colleagues Chris Wallace and former colleague Megyn Kelly mocking the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C. and saying they hope it fails horribly. They never stay there. And both reports are now saying that because of the existence of various text messages that reference the news media, congressional investigators are now working rightly to determine if there was any improper leaking to the press about the Russia investigation. How else would you interpret those words? Now, John Solomon, Sarah Carter, they're going to be here with all the explosive details. That's coming up. And also tonight, members of the media, liberals in Hollywood, they are absolutely giddy tonight over what? Oprah Winfrey's speech at the Golden Globes, which I would say was very good. Many are saying it sounded and she sounded presidential, and it was a campaign style delivery. And according to New reporting, Oprah's now considering running in 2020. Here's the part of what Oprah said at the Golden Globes. Let's take a look. So I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. Now to the media, the left in this country, Oprah, Oprah apparently is their chosen one. She's the new messiah that they will blindly worship and follow like the sheep that they are. And here's why. The media and the left in this country, well, they now seem to think that Oprah's the one person that hopefully can help them fulfill what is their ultimate goal, to destroy Donald Trump and defeat President Trump. Just look at how the media, how transparent they are, fawning over Oprah's speech. Does this remind you a little bit of the same people that never vetted Obama in 07 and 08? We don't know a lot about Oprah's politics at all. We know she's a very likable person on TV and a pretty inspiring life story. But watch this. She's known as the queen of talk. And last night, the world was listening. The all-star crowd captivated by her poignant message of female empowerment. A speech so inspiring, many now calling for Winfrey to add yet another title in front of her name, president. Oprah defining the night, bringing the audience to its feet, setting a new tone for Hollywood and men and women around the globe. 
after that speech, she had quite a few people in that room saying they sure did like the sound of President Winfrey. If she were to get in, the next day she'd probably be leading the fight for the Democratic nomination. She'd be leading the Democratic ticket. Nora, I was back in the one-on-one -on -one rooms while the speech was going on, and I will tell you this, everyone was mesmerized. That speech last night was not only empowering and inspirational, but I thought it also echoed a lot Hillary Clinton's concession speech. It was like five minutes of desperately needed therapy <laughs> for anybody who was watching. You know, yes. She gave a speech that gave people hope and it reminded people what is so great about this country and the strides that this country has made and how we still have so much to be hopeful for. That doesn't show their bias? Oh yeah, it does. Now after the speech, NBC, they even tweeted an endorsement for Oprah. Look at this. Nothing but respect for a future president. Now after NBC got called out for their massive display of bias, they deleted the tweet and quickly tried to shift blame to someone else by putting the statement on Twitter that says, quote, yesterday a tweet about the Golden Globes and Oprah Winfrey was sent by a third party, not them, an agency for NBC Entertainment in real time during the broadcast. It is a reference to a joke made during the monologue and not meant to be a political statement. Well, that's what they have MSNBC for. They're the operative arm and basically an extension of the press office, of course, of the anti-Trump media. We've since removed the tweet. Really? Does anyone believe that? I personally don't. A third party agency? What, they're trying to get some poor kid fired over this? Anyway, NBC got caught red handed and they're now trying to spin this and hope that will all go away. Let's be honest here. When you're talking about NBC, they're not fooling anyone about where their politics and their political allegiances lie. Look at conspiracy theory 24-7 MSNBC. Hate Trump, hate Trump, hate Trump. That's our programming for today. And NBC, like the rest of the media, they despise, they loathe, they hate the president. And it's not a secret. So let's just all stop pretending, because the game's over. Uh, by the way, NBC wasn't the only Destroy Trump outlet to heap praise on Oprah. Take a look at these headlines. You got the New York Times, President Oprah? After the Golden Globes, some have a 2020 vision. USA Today, Oprah 2020. Winfrey's Golden Globe speech has fans dreaming of presidential run. Deadline, Oprah kicks off 2020, White House bid, and other surprising moments from the Golden Globe Awards. The Guardian, could Oprah Winfrey run? run for president and win and then there's Hollywood after last night's speech all of these private jet liberals were all showing off their newfound political affection for Oprah this is their new savior take a look there is a movement afoot back here Oprah 2020 I'm not kidding I am all about Oprah 2020 honestly President Winfrey is just I think she's our next president. I'm, I'm crossing my fingers. Did any of them ever say a nice word about Trump? Ever? The economy's doing better than it has in eight years. Where does Oprah stand on the issues? And it doesn't end there. Here's what Meryl Streep is saying about Oprah. Quote, she launched a rocket tonight. I want her to run for president. I don't think she's had any intention of declaring, but now she doesn't have a choice. Poor Oprah, are you hearing that? Your life is now committed. And others, like Obama's former speechwriter, uh, his name is John Favreau. He got in the action of tweeting, oh, Oprah Winfrey is as brilliant and inspiring as any public figure today. She doesn't directly speak to celebrity America. She speaks to America. Don't underestimate her. At CNN, political analyst April Ryan tweeted this. If Oprah ran for president in 2020, she is every person. She has been poor, now rich. She's also a self-made billionaire. She has a grasp of the issues as she used to cover local politics. She can articulate any issue, and she has mass appeal beyond race and gender. Look, I know you people in Hollywood, and all of you in the liberal media, I know you're all intoxicated and addicted to Trump hate, but maybe you might want to just put a little bit of pressure on the brakes here with your Oprah obsession. You know, are you really ready to go that deep into what Oprah's speech, which I thought was brilliant in many ways. I have no problem with Oprah Winfrey. What she did last night in many ways was great. I'm glad to see she stood up for women, especially in Hollywood. I support that, as I think everyone should. And I also think Oprah has a tremendous capacity for human empathy. If you've ever watched her show, she has an incredible, strong, personal story, overcoming sadness and tragedy and a horrible upbringing. 
I applaud her for what she's done in her life. And politically, all I know is that she supported Barack Obama. Other than that, I don't know that much about her in terms of running for president. And as to the media and the snowflake Hollywood left, take a deep breath. Control your giddiness. I know you hate Trump. Let's not jump on the Oprah 2020 train just yet. The economy's never been better in eight years. And I know you don't like that this president actually stands up to North Korea and Iran, and he's not trying to bribe murdering dictators. You're gonna, gonna have to get used to peace through strength because it actually works. So buckle up, it's gonna be a rough three years from here. Now that's the problem with the law. I will never understand why they're looking for a Messiah, a savior, somebody that's gonna come in and save the country. We don't need another liberal chosen to fix our problems with more government. Reagan once said government is not the solution, it's the problem. We need more individual freedom in this country. We need more liberty in this country. We don't need more liberal policies out of Washington. Look at what those liberal ideas did to the economy and foreign policy in the last eight years. Can you even look? You all loved Obama. His track record was atrocious. And so to all of you starstruck people out there tonight, looking for your next chosen one, you may want to relax and stop trying to buy your ticket on the Oprah 2020 train. And here's the other point tonight. The hypocrisy from the left, liberals, the Golden Globe, is stunning. But sadly, it's not surprising. It's very predictable. Everyone, just like in the liberal media, everyone, to basically a person praising Oprah. And by the way, to the degree Hollywood for their movement about Me Too, etc. It's great what Oprah did by standing up for victims of sexual misconduct and abuse. I think it's awesome. But we can't forget that misconduct ha is and has been rampant in Hollywood for decades. I don't trust anyone that they really, in their deep heart of hearts, except the people that were victims, you know, actually believe all they're saying at this point. Why? Because there's a lot of hypocrites out there on this specific issue. For example, remember how Hollywood embraced director Roman Polanski? This is a guy that was accused of raping multiple times a 13-year-old girl. This was in 1977, after, of course, he gave her champagne and quaaludes. And at the time, Polanski was 43. He was eventually charged with six felony counts, but he fled to Europe before being sentenced. Now, you would think that after that, Hollywood be, would be completely in the business of disowning and renouncing Polanski. That never happened. Here's what it did instead. Back in 2003, Polanski won an Oscar for Best Director, and the celebrity-filled audience erupted in applause like I'd never heard before, even though Polanski can't come back to America because he was avoiding authorities overseas. Listen to the level of cheering when his name is called out by Harrison Ford. Watch this. Roman Polanski, the pianist. Really? Standing ovation? Raucous applause for a child rapist of a 13-year-old he gave drugs and alcohol to? And it gets worse. Hollywood support for Polanski didn't end in 2003 when he got the Oscar. When he got the Oscar in 2009 after Polanski was arrested in Switzerland in connection to the 1977 case that he ran away from, well, he had over 100 celebrities, many Hollywood, signing a petition demanding his release. So like I said, it's all great. Hollywood, pat yourself on the back, 50,000 award ceremonies a year. I can't stand it or watch a second of it. But it really, it took decades and countless people that suffered before you finally are able to do it and do it right. Joining us now with Reaction, we have the host of Michelle Malkin Investigate, CRTV Michelle Malkin, former White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer. You know, it was 2009, Michelle, when they're right, you know, many are signing a petition for Roman Polanski. You saw the roar and the standing ovation. I think what Oprah said is right. I think she's dead on. I have faith in her. I don't have faith in all these people racing for the next savior. 
Well, as the, in the clip that you just showed, uh, among the people who leapt to their feet for Roman Polanski were hypocrite Meryl Streep and, of course, now accused multiple predator Harvey Weinstein. And I have to disagree with you slightly, Sean, because as much as I've heard so much By the way, so we've been positive, family for years. You go right ahead. Did, everyone so else, can, where do you hear tonight's right, Hannity hate mail? Go ahead. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we, yeah, so uh, I do not join in all of the the uh, effusive praise for Oprah's speech last night. I thought it was textbook, partisan, uh, and ideological identity liberalism. And she herself is one who has been accused by um, multiple victims of Harvey Weinstein of being a fixer for Harvey Weinstein. There are many infamous pictures of her I've seen the pictures. hanging off of, but did, of but Weinstein. Did, but it, you have to be fair. She, did she know? We don't know if she knew. Well, a lot you know, of people have taken pictures listen, with me and you over the years. We don't know them. No question about it. But the uh, consensus from so many of the people who have been complaining about Harvey Weinstein for years and been ignored is that, quote unquote, everybody knew. Meryl Streep knew. And many people believe that Oprah Winfrey knew as well. So look, the idea that uh, Hollywood and Democrat uh, strategists think somehow that Oprah Winfrey has a chance in 2020 and that she's allowing all of this buzz to happen. Uh, she has her boyfriend, Stedman, uh, cheering on uh, all of the gossip about uh, a potential run. What would we get? We'd get another eight years of the same kind of Chicago machine identity liberalism that we got under Barack Obama, who uh, has in, in part so large uh, a role uh, of Oprah Winfrey to thank for getting to him, getting him where he was. And, and last night, all of Hollywood and, and Oprah were pretending as if the last eight years of the Obama administration didn't happen. And, and, and that's, to me, I think, w what's most troubling, the unreality of the people you in know, the Hollywood bubble. Sean, I guess the difference, I, I go back, I, I felt in many ways between vetting Obama and Reverend Wright and black liberation theology and Dorns and Ayers and Acorn and Alinsky and Frank Marshall Davis, I felt there were a few of us. Michelle, I know, was one. Um, and, and there were a few of us that vetted him. And then after eight years, there were very few of us that talked about what? We had 13 million more Americans on food stamps, 8 million more in poverty, the lowest labor participation rate since the 70s, worst recovery since the 40s, lowest home ownership rate in 51 years, and we doubled the debt, and he gave Iran $150 billion. So truth and facts and substance matters, but I kind of feel I was alone here in a lot of ways. I had Michelle, was like family to me, by my side and a few others. That's about it. So why the rush for a savior again when the last savior they chose failed so miserably? Well, look, I think the thing that's interesting is that what Oprah said last night, all Americans should agree with, and, and I, I agree with you, uh, that respecting women, creating a safe work environment for all individuals is something that we should all agree on. It should be beyond politics. It should be beyond uh, ideology. It should be something that every American and every human supports. Uh, that being said, I think that the interesting thing last night is she didn't talk about policy. She didn't talk about how to solve some of the more controversial issues. And to your point right now, I mean, they're about to coronate somebody who gave a speech on frankly, something that not only should we all agree on, but something that you aptly point out is highly hypocritical well, for way, most of the people in that room. They uh, did that. Where, where, I mean, Sean, it's not just Roman Polanski, it's, it's Bill Clinton, it's others who, when Good they're point. given an opportunity to speak Checkmate. out, they overlooked it. They, they did more. You know, you had to sit in a room, I don't know how the hell you did your job for as long as you did, and I noticed in an interview with SE Cup, you were kind of hard on yourself, and I'm thinking, you know, you really didn't do that much role because they were so hostile. I can't think of a moment they've given Trump a break and they gave Obama every break. Oh, both before, during and after. <laughs> What's your experience Even with the, the press? Center, uh, the oh, it, it, I mean, look, I, I had known a lot of these guys for for 
sometimes in some cases more than two decades. I think there was unbelievably a, a massive hostility never seen before, and the Pew Center backed it up. 63% of the coverage against President Trump was negative, only 5% positive, which is three times what that was of Obama. I mean, they came out guns a blazing in the mainstream media. Uh, they, were, they were upset that they were wrong, and they were going to take it out on their coverage. All right, last word, Michelle. Well, I, I think that Hollywood and the Democrats need to put down the Oprah bong and stop inhaling. And I think probably the reason why they're so desperate is if you look at the current field of Democrat potential candidates for 2020, you've got the pretendian Elizabeth Warren. You've got uh, Bernie Sanders, who will be 79. Uh, Maxine Waters, who's cast as the fresh face of the Democrat Party. No wonder they're grasping for the straw of Oprah Winfrey. All right, guys, good to see you. Uh, appreciate you both being with us. By the way, on the Hannity hotline, one guy writes tonight, says tonight, you'll hear it, every time you open your mouth, Hannity, a kitten dots. Oh. I'm like, wow, it's rough out here. Anyway, coming up, we expose our breaking story tonight, the fake, phony, anti-Trump book. The mainstream media is phoning about John Solomon, Sarah Carter, their breaking news on the anti-Trump FBI agent. New text tonight, part of Mueller's special counsel and leaking to the press. We'll explain. The only person who's called himself a genius Congress. in the last week is the president. But the, the, Which because happens to be a true statement. Okay. A self-made billionaire who revolutionized reality TV and, and who sure has changed the course of our politics. He's watching and he's happy that you said that. There's right. one viewer that you care about right now and you're being obsequious. No, you're being which, a factotum no, in you're order to being, please him. Okay. No. And I think, you know, I've you know I, I think I've wasted enough of my you viewers' who I, time. You know Thank who you, I care Stephen. about? As Republicans, hey, lawmakers call for Attorney General Jeff Sessions to resign. From CNN, fake news, Jake Tapper rudely cutting off White House advisor Stephen Miller. The two were debating the contents of Michael Wolff's now widely discredited book. Now, Wolf himself has been making the media rounds, but even he is casting doubt on whether or not you can trust what he wrote in his own book. This is pretty spectacular, actually. Watch this. You have tapes. Are you going to release the tapes? No, I'm going to do, you know, I have what every journalist, I work like like every journalist. I have tapes, I have notes. But if people um, are questioning it, why not produce the evidence? Like, here, because here what because that's not what, what I'm, not, I'm not in your business. I, my evidence is the book. Read the book. If it makes sense to you, if it strikes a quiff, if it rings true, it is true. If it rings true, it is true. Oh, we have a new standard in journalism, I guess. By the way, he writes about me in the book. I never got a phone call. Michael Wolf, hello, still waiting. What you wrote's not true. And it's not just me. There are a ton of claims now that the book, you know, people are now saying are complete fabrications and lies. Meanwhile, President Trump's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon, he put out a statement this weekend expressing regret for comments that he made in the book about the president and his son, Donald Trump Jr. And Bannon says his support for the president, his agenda is unwavering that Donald Trump Jr. is both a patriot and a good man. And he went on to say that there is no collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia and the investigation is a witch hunt. Well, let me guess. I bet we'll see Steve's remarks being played over and over again for 72 hours like the first remarks. And the New York Times will put it on, well, note, page 828, where nobody can see it. Joining us now with reaction, former Secret Service agent Dan Bongino, the author of the brand new book. It's out today. It's on Amazon.com, bookstores everywhere, Hannity.com, The New American Revolution, The Making of a Populist Movement. RNC spokesperson Kaylee McEnany is with us. I always have the hardest time with your name. I have no idea why. You've gotten it like four times today, so we're good. All right, we're good. <laughs> Let, let's start with the reaction to the book, all the facts that he's even admitting that he really didn't have right and the fact that he said this will bring down the presidency in a radio interview with the BBC this weekend. Right. This is a fake, fraudulent, phony book. Belongs in the tabloid section of a supermarket. You've exposed several of the lies in this book. I, in my own book, exposed several of the lies. It's so funny. He says he knows what the president's reaction was when he became president. He says he got this from Steve Bannon. Well, guess what? When the president was in the small kitchen in Trump Tower, Ivanka was there, Jared was there, a few others. Steve Bannon was not there. Somehow, Wolf 
purports to know. He says Trump was horrified when he became president. Not the case. What happened was Trump had written a pre-planned acceptance speech. He ripped it up, put it aside, wrote a new one when he saw crying Hillary voters. Those are the actions of a leader, not a horrified individual. I, I, I know from my own experience on election day, Kellyanne knew he could win. Absolutely never wavered. He says, oh, she was acting as though we were going to lose. I know what he said about me is not true. And then I talked to the president, now president, but the candidate on election day. I called him three times, Dan Bongino, three. Yeah. Once to say, don't believe the exit polls. It's just like 2004. Once to say, it's looking really good. And the next time before any network called it, congratulations, Mr. President. Those were my three calls. Yes, Sean. One of the one of the funniest parts of the book is where he claims that the president doesn't know who Boehner is. He was well, golfing. He tweeted with John out five Boehner. times before. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, he's golfing with him. You don't golf this guy. Yeah. I mean, this, listen, the book is, this is, uh, yeah, I'm not even going to say it's National Enquirer stuff because the National Enquirer occasionally got things right, like the John Edwards story. So they're actually like, this is, the National Enquirer is a level above this book. But let, let me just tell you the inside story. Here's what's really going on with this book. And here's why the media needs this book to be true. The Democrats are panicking right now, Sean, and Kaylee, I, I know, feels the same way about this. The tax cuts have them running for the hills. They thought it was going to flame out like Obamacare, and it didn't. They thought the failure of the tax cut plan was going to empty Trump's political bank account. Once his political bank account, his political capital was empty, they were going to move to impeach. Now that doesn't look likely. They know he's moving with a conservative agenda that's now going to work because the economy's turning around and they're panicking. That's where the book comes in. It provides a basis for round two, which is the 25th Amendment, that he's mentally unstable, okay, which is quite that. possibly the dumbest narrative I've ever heard. And our breaking news, you, know, you, you write a lot about this in, in your book, The New American Revolution, The make it, Making of a Populist. I see that this president, I've not changed my views since I supported Reagan. All right. I know a little before your time. You're the next generation right behind me. But the point is, he's never wavered on his promises. We had a year's worth of incredible economic success. And they don't like that he's actually standing up to murdering dictators. Absolutely. Yeah. He is achieving at record rates, Sean. You look at circuit judges uh, confirmed at a rate what, never How many? A hundred and a hundred whatever. Seven, yes, right. but it's a record. You look at stock market breaking records. Uh, you look at tax cuts. We haven't had that in three decades. Regulations being rescinded at a and fast Obama rate. And Obama failed. He Why failed. can't they, anybody in the media yes. acknowledge the failure? Absolutely. He was an utter failure. This president's achieving. They can't take it. It's why when I sat on a panel with eight liberals over at CNN. By the they way, had to you have my sympathy. Uh, trust me, it was tough. I, I did write the, the forward book. to your book. I you did. did write the forward. And to I my talked book. about that. And you sent me very nice notes of encouragement occasionally throughout the election. You and Jeff Lord, the only two over there. Yes. Well, this was the voice of sanity for Jeffrey Lord and I, this show. What, what do you make, Dan, about the Oprah phenomenon? It's, it's very reminiscent to me of, yes, we can. Obama, change, change, change change. We had eight years of it and it failed miserably and things are working now. Why do they want a savior? Why are they so full of hatred for this president? You know, Sean, because the Democrats, their entire ideology, liberals, is, is built on this cult of personality. Remember, what's the essence of conservatism at its core? It's a set of objective values, big R rights from God. We have a, we have a lodestar that guides us all the time. Yeah. The, the person that gets us there is just a vehicle. He hasn't become like a golden calf for us. That's not the case with the left. They believe in the all, their lodestar is the state. The representative of the state is the politician. They need a cult of personality. They need Need right, a golden I, calf, and Oprah is the golden calf of the day. And does anybody even know a thing about our politics? All right, congrats, by the way, on the on the new book, Kaylee. Thank you. Amazon.com, bookstores everywhere. All right, when we come back, our investigative report tonight: John Solomon, Sarah Carter, this hour with new explosive reports on the anti-Trump agent within the FBI and new text. They'll be joined by lawyer, attorney, Harvard professor Alan Dershowitz. Straight ahead.
All right, Fox News contributor Sarah Carter and The Hill's John Solomon each out with brand new reports detailing the ongoing allegations in the House and the Senate as to whether the FBI agent, remember Peter Strzok and other FBI employees, may have been responsible for media leaks surrounding the Russia investigation. Joining us to break it all down are The Hill's John Solomon, Fox News contributor Sarah Carter, and along with us, the author of the bestseller, Trumped Up, Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz is with us. All right, let, let's get to the details. John will We'll start with you. Basically, they are admitting when they talk about, oh, they have advanced knowledge of this thing. Oh, the article is out, but hidden behind a, a paywall. And then it gets, you know, goes through a whole, the whole tone is anti-bureau. Just the tiny bit from us, Page replies. There's more red than the CF article. I mean, are they not referencing they are leaking to the press? And what does that mean? How profound is that? I don't think we know entirely, but congressional investigators certainly have a strong suspicion that these text messages point to an operation inside the FBI that was leaking information, spinning reporters, tracking down reporters. There's a whole effort where the two of them are trying to track down the great reporter from the New York Times, Matt Apuzzo. And, and why else would they be trying to track down a reporter unless someone wanted to talk to him? Uh, but I, I walked away. Walked, I read through hundreds of these messages over the week. I walked away from one thing. I remember the moment when James Comey in his testimony said, uh, FBI agents don't give a rip about politics and they don't leak. After you read these messages, you walk away thinking these two FBI agents cared a lot about politics and they were monitoring the media almost like they were a press office. I keep hearing, sir, Sarah, that we're going to learn a lot more about a connection between some people within the intelligence community and the CIA and elsewhere about their relationships with the media. But my more specific question for the moment has to do with, I think, one of the worst parts of this is they're looking up the names of the family, the kids of a particular New York Times reporter? What, because they don't I like his reporting? Well, we don't know, do we? we these, these are the questions that the committee members want to have answered, and that's why they want to interview Strzok. They want to interview Lisa Page. And remember, this is just what we've been looking at, these text messages between the two of them. But you also have General Counsel James Baker, who they want to question, and Andrew Weissman, who's over at the DOJ. What with about the Page counsel. advising McCabe? Exactly. Page advising McCabe and all of the questions that they have regarding, you know, the insurance policy with McCabe. So they're going to want to question Andrew McCabe, the deputy director. And this who's is only going to be leaving in March. A few hundred texts and it's going to be slow released to these agencies, uh, to these the House and Senate committees. Well, we're hoping 9,500. 9,500, but they're expected to receive all of those very soon. They won't be no. slow rolled out. We're expecting a lot by January 11th. You see this type of leaking. Um, I have followed your comments on this very, very closely. And then you see that the Trump-Russia collusion narrative is really dying and withering on a vine. Now they've moved into a collective media bubble that, oh, this president, let's, let, we got to go to the 25th Amendment. What is your reaction to all of it? 25th Amendment is totally irrelevant to what's going on. It was designed for somebody who had a stroke or was involved in a serious accident and was incapacitated. It requires the vice president, the cabinet, two-thirds of each house of Congress. It's a fool's errand. It's not going to happen. Think about it. Of course it's not going to happen. But what they're trying to do, though, is now that they couldn't criminalize political differences, they're trying to pathologize, to, to psychiatrize political differences. They're trying to say, oh, maybe we can't get him on crime, but we're going to show that he has mental problems, that he's disturbed. A guy on CNN today was talking about he has Alzheimer's, he should be subjected to an exam. Thing. That is so dangerous. That's what they did in the former Soviet Union. I was involved representing some dissidents in the Soviet Union mm -hmm. who were sent to mental hospitals. They did that in China. They did that in apartheid South what Africa. What did you know, Nathan or, or, or Solzhenitsyn? They, there was a guy. Solzhenitsyn named, gave that big speech. I think it might have been at Harvard. Was at Harvard. I was right. there. Right. It was a guy named Roy Medvedov who wrote a book about being committed to a psychiatric hospital. But it was a pervasive way that tyrannical governments use the power of psychiatry to try to not answer the merits. We don't want to debate the merits. He's crazy. The Soviet Union was notorious for this. Wasn't they were doing it they? all the time. And the American Psychiatric Association sent a delegation, and the American Psychiatric 
Psychiatric Association at the Goldwater case said it is wrong for any psychiatrist right. ever to diagnose anybody without them examining them. Look, I taught law and psychiatry for 25 years at Harvard. I co I co edited the textbook right. on law and psychiatry and the first rule of psychiatry is you do not diagnose based on political so grounds funny you say this. or based on I, I, years ago I read the guy. book the synthesis of Russian mind control right. techniques yeah, it's right, everything right. you're discussing right. and it's all true and every bit of it's so true. Dangerous. So dangerous. You don't like somebody, vote against them. Exactly. I voted against Donald Trump. Amazing. I voted for Hillary Clinton. By the way, but that's the only thing we disagree on. Okay. Uh, but, I'm but, just teasing. But I'm doing it not from a political perspective. No, but you're doing it from a constitutional and law pr if they perspective were... and, and the threat to the Constitution. Right. This is a clear and present danger. It's a, let, me, let me bring John and Sarah back in. Sarah, you add to that. You know, when you start surveilling, unmasking, you don't minimize, and then you leak raw intelligence. They did that to General Flynn. And then I'm sure, I will bet everything I have, that they said, oh, you either agree that you lied to us, or we're going after your oh, son. Of course. Oh, of course they did. Of course, right? And, and, course. That's, and that is definitely what I'm hearing from my sources. I mean, right now, Sean, there are 27 leak investigations at the Department of Justice. That's triple what they had over the last three years. So 27 leak investigations. One of those, I guarantee you, is General Flynn. The leak, the classified leak between General Flynn and his talks phone about conversation with Keith. There was a crime there. It was a it was a major crime, and and we're looking at those leaks, and we're also looking at the inspector general right now. We're waiting on that inspector that report, general's yeah. report. It's only a crime and if it's a grand be the jury. Biggest. It's only a crime if it's leaking grand jury minutes. Not FBI right just leaking is a violation of their rules, but it's not itself a crime. Look, mm -hmm. leaking has been a weapon of prosecutors for years. I've had prosecutors tell me implicitly, if you don't plead your client guilty, you will be shocked at what will come out about him. Death by a thousand and cuts isn't a professor. That's exactly right. And no. I'm against it, whether it's leaking against Hillary Clinton or care. leaking against Donald Trump. It's wrong. You don't leak. John Solomon, um, we only have a small percentage of these. And I'm that's like, right. wow, if we only have hundreds and there's thousands, what's next? Yeah, I think the question is, uh, who's going to follow this breadcrumb trail? Somebody led a breadcrumb trail to create the Russian narrative. we got to get to the bottom of it. Great work. Thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you. you. When we come back, Tommy Laren, she goes to the streets of California and talks to residents about being a sanctuary state. You don't want to miss these responses. We are proudly supporting the men and women of law enforcement, including our wonderful ICE officers and Border Patrol agents. These are incredible people who endorsed me during the campaign, and they are incredible. They're doing a great job at the border, by the way. We are going to end chain migration. We are going to end the lottery system, and we are going to build the wall. We need two or three hundred miles of that wall or else by November of 2018 so people can see it and they'll believe it. Earlier today, the president promising to reform our immigration system, which is so broken, build that wall. Last Monday, California officially became a sanctuary state when a law took effect, preventing state and local police from asking people about their immigration status or from cooperating with federal immigration enforcement activities in most cases. Fox News contributor Tommy Laren hit the streets to ask residents of California what they think of this new law. Watch this. California is now a sanctuary state for illegal immigrants? Of course I know that. And how do you feel about it? Uh, I think it's great. I think it's finally, it's, it's been a matter of time where we need immigrants to be protected and I think being a sanctuary state is just perfect. Why are we making it difficult for them to become legal? They don't pay their taxes if it's difficult for them to be legal. They don't do what you complain about constantly on your channel if it's not legal. So why not make it legal for them to do it? And then you'd stop complaining. You can't have it both ways. If we're going to benefit from cheap labor, then we also have to give them the benefits that every American citizen can benefit from. Being an immigrant from Mexico myself, I think that it's an incredible opportunity to stimulate the economy by integrating workers, that it will take certain jobs that many of the currently employed Americans won't. And um, I think it's a great opportunity. It's all right. I love it. You know, I'll admit I got, you know, family members of myself that are illegal. Uh, 
I mean, just being free, you know, you're just out here trying to do yourself. Did yeah. you know that this was a sanctuary state for illegal immigrants? I did. And what do you think about that? Um, you know, I think we need to come up with an immigration bill that will solve all the problems and help uh, immigrants that are here illegally transmit and become U.S. citizens. I don't, I don't think they should... Uh, <clears throat> Come over here. You said illegal immigrants? Yeah, I don't I don't think they should just stay where they at. Don't, don't come over here. Why? Why are they going to be over here? How do you feel about legal immigrants that have done it the right way, that have paid a lot of money, waited a lot of time to come into this country? Do you feel like it invalidates everything that they've worked for to let illegal immigrants receive sanctuary in California? I don't think it's fair that you're pitting one against the other. I think that one came here fairly and one came here in a sense... Unfairly? In a sense, it, it, it's not such a black and white thing. You know, both people came here to feed their families. But if the laws are not being enforced, is that also a problem? It's, it's one of these unenforceable laws. I'm an immigrant and I had to go through process. It took three and a half years to come to America. I think everybody should go through a process. Sanctuary cities have always been around. They've only become part of this like popular conversation because of the way that society has attempted to villainize immigrants. They do it illegally because they either don't have like the means to get in or like a safer way to get in either. Illegal is illegal. Um, we want to be compassionate, but we also have uh, the rule of law. Fox News contributor Tommy Laren joins us. Wow, that's your state, right? It is my state, Sean. What can I tell you? Thirteen and a half percent income tax rate in the state. I mean, doesn't Texas and Florida, they have pretty good infrastructure. I can tell you it's better than New York. Why is there that overwhelming feeling? Is this just a California thing to you? Well, to be fair, there are a lot of Californians that are moving to Florida and Texas and elsewhere because of California, because of the rules and the regulations and because of things like it being a sanctuary state. But I got to tell you, I'm going to some breaking news. California is not a lost cause. I promise you it's not. There are so many undercover conservatives in this state that I spoke to that are level-headed, that don't like the fact that it's a sanctuary state. Sometimes there are others, though, that are a little bit louder. Squeaky wheel gets the grease a lot of times. Why should they get federal tax dollars in any way and let, if, they're not, if they're literally aiding and abetting law-breaking as a state? Well, they absolutely shouldn't. But you have to understand there are a lot of Californians that are into the whole peace, love, and welcome everyone, unless you're Tommy Lahren or Fox News, and then, you know, their tune completely changes. I'll tell you those stories later. But again, these people in California, they want to be welcoming of everyone. They want to bring everyone in until you remind them that legal immigrants had to spend a lot of money and wait a lot of time to get in to this country and into the state. And then their tune changed just a little bit. It was quite fascinating. You know, I was really interested as I was watching this this package you put together and I'm interested that a lot of people knew you knew about Fox News knew our opinions that one guy in particular on the right I guess it looks like a black shirt to me and and uh, the other guy in the gray shirt and I'm thinking did it how was their reaction to you in the channel because yeah they're kind of right there are a few of us that are real conservatives that actually speak and I don't know if they ever met one before well, I want to be fair. We did encounter a lot of really respectful people that liked what we do on Fox News, that like what I do. But it was interesting. I spent some time in West Hollywood. And, Sean, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with West Hollywood, but I it's am. a very liberal area. It's the, um, as they call it, the epicenter of the resistance. And uh, they certainly knew who I was. And there are some words that I can't repeat on national television that they were screaming at me. They saw the Fox News mic. They weren't thrilled that we were there. They told us to get out. And I reminded them that they're supposed to be the loving and tolerant left, welcoming of everyone, unless you're Fox News or Tommy Lahren, and then you're supposed to get out. Very interesting the way that works. Yeah. Um, all right. Great job, Tommy. We really appreciate it. All right. So the Hannity hotline's next. It says, every time I open my mouth, a kitten dies. Wow. Well, that's cold. And our video of the day is straight ahead. All right, time for the video of the day. Tonight's clip brought to you by our good friend, Liberal Joe and Mika Brzezinski, who decided to share, in her case, the terrible strife that she and all her elitist friends are forced to endure abroad under the Trump presidency. It's so upsetting. Watch. 
I had some friends that went to Paris over the holiday, and they said they were viscerally... Paris, Texas, right? Paris, France. Oh, Paris, France. And they said they were just That's viscerally movie, embarrassed to be That's Americans. Right, right, right. They said it was, it was the first time that it was sort of chilling, that they didn't even want to share <clears throat> where they were from. The vapors. The vapors. The vapors. Oh, the horror. <laughs> make his friends. I hear there are many European countries with loose immigration laws. Maybe they'd be happy to take a huge chunk of your income in exchange for citizenship. If you're that embarrassed, see you later. And before we go tonight, time for some messages on the Hannity hotline. Wow. Every time I speak, apparently I kill a kitten. Listen. Hey, Sean, I just wanted to let you know that every time you open your mouth, a small kitten dies. You need to get